force me to give them password access to all of my applications in my phone that they still have in their custody right now to this day. Couldn't say it in a, in a private function, at home, on the internet. I had to delete everything on all my social medias that was against the COVID restrictions. Well, I've been arrested multiple times in, in, in Victoria. We just had absolute brutality towards us. Uh, we, got, we got shot with big rubber bullets during protests. Kids got pepper sprayed. Old women got pushed down and then pepper sprayed. People were desperate and, and depressed and angry. And, I, and you don't need to be a doctor to know that that's not healthy. You couldn't go to work. You couldn't leave your house for more than five kilometres or for more than an hour. My lawyers said that they had seen less bail conditions and less restrictions on someone who's ran through a house with a machete. All right, Monica, hello. Hey, how are you? Not bad. Uh, can you please introduce yourself? My name is Monica Smith. I um, started an organisation called Reignite Democracy Australia in August 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, but most recently, I started a, a global spin off of that called Reignite Freedom, mm -hmm. uh, which has initiated the global walkout. And uh, we're here in Amsterdam. So, wow. so let, let's maybe set the clock back two or three years. Let's sort of set oh. the stage for the oh, audience yeah. Yeah. who might have never heard your story. Okay. Can you tell them uh, sort of what happened, let's say, prior to the lockdowns? and then when the lockdowns began. Okay, so prior to the lockdowns, I was uh, traveling the world on my own, doing interviews and things like that. So that's probably where I got some of my confidence from. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back when we could actually travel, um, it was lovely. Uh, I came home, Corona hit. To Australia. To Australia, yeah. sorry, I'm Australian. I came home to Australia, Corona hit, and I was like, what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and it was uh, like everyone, you know, we kind of wanted to see what was happening, um, you know, if it was deadly or not and things like that. But about three months in, mm -hmm. uh, Melbourne, which is where I'm from, the Premier is Daniel Andrews, mm -hmm. um, we had a four month lockdown during winter. There was a curfew. You couldn't leave the house more than five kilometres. You couldn't exercise for more than an hour. Mm -hmm. Not that anyone can police that anyway it was winter it was dark and I could just feel that people were desperate and and depressed and angry and I and you don't need to be a doctor to know that that's not healthy mm -hmm. so I came up with an idea for a live stream protest that's where reignite democracy Australia came mm -hmm. um, but really what your audience will be more interested in is not how I started but probably what happened since then um, is well I've been arrested multiple times in in, in Victoria we just had absolute brutality towards us. Uh, we got we got shot with big rubber bullets during protests. Kids got pepper sprayed. Old women got pushed down and then pepper sprayed. They shot us with these rubber bullets in the back. So we're clearly walking away. They're meant to use it to stop, you know, confrontation, not the other way around. And these rubber bullets, just for your information, they have a higher fatality rate than COVID, you know? And so um, that was really shocking to see them, see the police use that. But anyway, so I've been in amongst all those protests, all that really terrible, it was like being in a war zone or a game show or something like that. Wow. But really, um, it all came to a head when um, I got arrested for incitement, mm -hmm. um, which is inciting people to break COVID restrictions, mm -hmm. which is kind of like if you were to tell your friend to park in a no parking zone yeah. and they got a ticket and then you got a criminal charge for it because yeah. the COVID fines are only fines, they're not criminal offences. Anyway. Mm. The bail conditions were so horrendous. It was gonna close down my website. I was not able to speak against the COVID restrictions. Like I couldn't even say, oh, I don't like this mask um, mask rules. I couldn't I couldn't even use my words in the bail conditions. You couldn't say it or, I, you, or you can record yourself saying I it? I couldn't say it in a, in a private function, at home, on the internet. I had to delete everything on all my social medias that was against the COVID restrictions. Wow. Not. They didn't say that incited people to break the COVID restrictions, but just was in opposition to the COVID restrictions. I was like, I'm not signing that. Right. Um, they also had a curfew for me from 7 p.m. to 6 a.m. on the bail conditions. For your information, I'm still on bail. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that I would have to be home every night wow. <laughs> till now. So I didn't sign. That's why I went to prison for 22 days, not because of the incitement charges themselves. Mm -hmm. um, we appealed those bail conditions and all the... Uh, I would say communistic ones mm -hmm. uh, were taken away. The judge agreed that it was over the top, mm -hmm. and I've been free to speak ever since. And um, but just really quickly, since then, I pled not guilty to the incitement charges, 
So they dug a little deeper and um, they got a warrant called a 465 AA warrant in Australia uh, to force me to give them password access to all of my applications in my phone that they still have in their custody right now to this day. Google Maps, Google Drive, Google Docs, all my admin accounts, all my emails, t uh, Twitter, um, you know, all that. I mean, I mean, um, uh, Telegram, Signal, everything. And I was like, I'm not giving them that. You know, no one will ever want to email me again, you know, and yeah. private and confidential. So if I didn't give them the passwords, it was up to five years in prison, which is worse than the original crime. And it, then it's a whole new set of charges and a whole new thing. And it was a breach of bail to not comply as well, which I could go to prison for three months. So I just thought I'd try my luck and I just said no mm -hmm. um, and I said if you want to arrest me let me know so I can be in comfortable clothes this time mm -hmm. and um, they dropped the charges the week after wow. so they pushed and pushed and I um, just said no sometimes it's worth gambling you know like a poker game bluffing yeah. and it worked and uh, so he here I am and they treated you like a real terrorist because I can yeah. imagine in a Western country, who else would you request to have all their passwords for? It would be either like a kingpin drug dealer or a terrorist. Oh, it's crazy. My lawyers said that they had seen less bail conditions and less restrictions on someone who's ran through a house with a machete, mm. you know, with children in the house, you know. So the original, original bail conditions, they even wanted access to my bank accounts, uh, which got scrapped, which is good. But yeah, it's it's really weird to be treated like that because um. I'm a law-abiding, tax-paying citizen. Um, I'm literally just standing up for human rights. That's yeah. it, you know? Uh, I wanted to actually rewind a little mm. bit. So when, when the lockdowns started uh, in, in Melbourne, from, from what I've uh, gathered from the news I followed in Australia, they were some of the heavy, most heavy-handed in the mm. country, right? So when that happened, how did the, the people react when they were only allowed to exercise for, let's say, an hour a day? And, you know, they had these, these curfews and, you know, they had all these different restrictions for four months. How did they react? Did the people generally accept it or was there like grumblings underneath the surface? Oh, I mean, we have, I've traveled now a little bit and I think that we have one of the strongest um, freedom movements in, in the world mm. um, because of that. You know, when we started to create community groups during lockdowns, there's some sort of element of excitement to it because mm -hmm. you feel like you're, uh, you know, doing something wrong, you know. And so those bonds that we've created have been really, really powerful, um, and it's kept us going through to this time. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're really strong if something else happens. But of course, a lot of people complied mm -hmm. and were angry at us for doing it. And I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on statistics, but if I was to guess, mm -hmm. I think at least 50% of people didn't like the lockdowns, don't agree with the mandates, and all that but only 10% of people are willing to walk in the streets for it. Mm -hmm. um, so until those other 40% feel like the 10% is part of the in crowd, mm -hmm. they're, not gonna, they're not gonna say that they're a part of our community, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think deep down, I think a lot of people are and all they need is just a little push mm -hmm. and they'll be openly on us on our side. You're saying that sort of 50% complied and they're sort of down, down with the program. 40% are disgruntled, but they're kind of quietly just, you know, watching and, you know, talking maybe under their breath. And 10% were actually out on the street saying, hey, this is yeah. not what we're going to be doing. Yeah. Not wearing a mask and holding their head up high mm. and protesting every weekend. I mean, the, we had one protest, just so that you know, how did we respond? We had one protest in Melbourne that was a, about 650 to 700,000. Mm. Now, we only have wow. 6 million people in the whole state. And that state is the same size as some state, uh, you know, some states in America where you have to drive a long way to get to the city. Mm. Um, so the fact that there was, let's say there was 600,000 there, there was at least three people at home that agreed with that 600,000. Mm. That's more than half of the entire population probably wanted to be at that protest. Yeah. So I would say that uh, we're pretty against it. How did the media react to the protest? Oh, there was 10,000 people there. Uh, you know, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, and we're we're the reason everyone is being locked down and mm. and, and things like that. But mm. um, and you know, I will say with the police, you know, like I did see police crying under their masks when they were, they were they did this thing called kettling. Have you heard of that? No. Um, it's where they 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 surround a group of protesters and then they pick them off one by one to process them or find them or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was a day, it was about two years ago now, and uh, there was 400 people, there was old women in there, there was old men, children. They surrounded them in the sunshine for four hours. They couldn't go to the toilet, they had no water. Wow. And it was just so strange. And the next day, there was a, a big public event at the horse race with thousands of people, mm. but 400 people couldn't protest. It was very strange. 
But, you know, the police were um, struggling with it, I think. But, um, you know, they did it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's what I was going to ask you, because I know in America there was a similar situation where you had the lockdowns, you had some counter protests, which were demonized in the media, but then you had, for instance, BLM rallies, which were praised in the media. So you had a similar situation in Australia. So about two months before the protest that I was um, in trouble for promoting, mm -hmm. there was a Black Lives Matter protest, and it was exactly the same restrictions, right? but no one got in trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, this has been used a lot. And maybe it's one of the reasons they, they dropped the charges because you just can't really explain it, mm -hmm. you know? They did say, well, they were wearing masks or they tried to socially distance. I mean, you can't socially distance with thousands of people. It right. just doesn't work. But yeah, yeah that, that contradiction. And like I said, that, that one day we had the kettling and then the next day we had a thousand um, people, thousands of people at this, uh, at this horse racing event. And then, and then at, at the same time, we had a, um, a, a Anzac Day, which is a memorial day for the, the soldiers. Mm -hmm. um, that was cancelled, right? Mm -hmm. And then the next day, they had a huge football game wow. the next day. And so people aren't that stupid mm -hmm. all the time. I think they realised that there was some contradictions there. Yeah, wow. Yeah. What, what about your role in the, in, in the anti-lockdown protest? Were you helping to organise or were you acting as a journalist? Actually, at the beginning, I was acting as a journalist, but also I would initiate a lot of campaigns, so letterbox drops or things to make people feel like they're fighting back, you know, in, in, in some way. So that was probably more my my role, and I was doing a lot of interviews. I actually did not organise protests. I never organised protests, but I promoted them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say that uh, I am going to film that event on the weekend, you know, and nice. that because you weren't allowed to actually promote it just like, hey guys, come to this protest. I would just be like, just so you guys know, I'm filming at this protest on the weekend. Right, so, right, right. I mean, it was a loophole and I, I was I was flirting with danger, mm -hmm. um, danger, you know. Um, so that, that was kind of my involvement there. Um, but also what I think is the most impactful for the people um, that, that my organization has been able to do is create community groups. So we have about 100 community groups all around the country. Mm -hmm. um, some of them have 30 people in them, some of them have 200 people in them. Mm -hmm. And they support each other uh, through thick and thin. During the lockdowns, they were catching up illegally, um, mm -hmm. you know, under trees or bridges or, you know, things like that, hiding from the police and things like that. So um, those connections um, are going to last a lifetime. And it's impossible to um, put a value on it or measure it. But I know for sure it's probably the best thing that that I've been able to do with that with the database, you know. Yeah. You know, I've seen some clips of uh, Avi Yemeni from, mm -hmm. from Rebel News, and sometimes when the police accosted him, he would show them his credentials, and he's like, "Hey, I'm a journalist. Yeah. You know, you can't do this." And he would actually fight back pretty successfully. Yes. When you told the police that you're a journalist, mm -hmm. you know, you can't arrest me. I'm, I'm out here doing my job. How did they react to you? They arrested me. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So I, uh, there was one day, it was a year before I got arrested and actually put in prison. Um, it was October 1st, 1st uh, 31st, 2020. I got arrested three times in one day. Um, I had my papers with me, which I hate to admit that I even went along with that, but I did. I had my permit with me and um, they told me to leave the area. And I said, but why? I've got my cameraman here. I'm um, doing my job. And they're like, well, no. And I'm like, I'm not leaving. And so they arrested me. And then they let me go and they're like, okay, you need to leave. And I'm like, no. So they arrested me again and they put me in the back of a Dibby van mm -hmm. for 45 minutes and then they let me go. And then they arrested me again and fined me. And I'm like, I've got my permit right here. I had a mask exemption. All so, that. You said, yeah. so you had a permit from the government to, to do journalistic yeah. work? Yeah, but they didn't care. Wow. They just said, well, we don't, like they just didn't care. It, the thing is, is the rules were so confusing mm -hmm. and there were so many alterations every day that actually no one knew what they were doing. Mm. So if you encountered a policeman that woke up on the wrong side of the bed, he's just going to make things up and hope and, and they get away with it. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, that's pretty much I'm, I was literally at the table while they were finding me with my firm. I'm like and they didn't even they ignored they literally ignored me. They, they didn't even recognize that I was speaking to them. They just kept writing their fine. Yeah, no, that's shocking. and I'm still fighting those fines and it's such a waste of time and it's so embarrassing to be in an Australian magistrate's court talking, ima imagine a magistrate saying to you, oh look, you know, I'm sorry but I do have to fine you because you were 200 metres out of your five kilometres and, and your mask was, was, was not pulled up properly, yeah. I'm, I'm going to have to fine you. Can you imagine those words coming out of it? It just, it sounds like you're in some sort of weird movie and I'm like, yeah. 
What is happening? And the courts are full of these right now in Australia. Mm. This conversation is happening over and over again. Like, oh, sorry, I had an extra friend with me at the park. <laughs> That's shocking. <laughs> it's, it's funny, but it's really sad too. I, there, there was a <laughs> refrain I heard during the, the peak of it where it was kind of a joke, you know, people referencing the boomerang, you know, Australia started as a prison colony oh. and it boomerang you know, after a hundred years back to a prison colony. Cause you guys had some of the strictest lockdowns and the, the type of stuff you're describing is like out of this world. Well, we had 240 days of lockdown mm -hmm. in Victoria. So it was the longest lockdown. 240 days. That's like yes. three quarters of a year. Yes. Kids were not in school. You couldn't go to work. You couldn't leave your house for more than five kilometers or for more than an hour. And you couldn't end, even in that five kilometre radius, you had to leave the house for only four essential reasons as well, on top of that. Like, it, it was it was a prison. It was a prison. Obviously, I didn't follow any of them. Yeah. But some people did, and they got really depressed. And I'm telling you, people now say that if you went to Melbourne, if you're in touch with energies or whatever, you would probably feel it. There is, there is a massive PTSD problem in Victoria, but... There is an election in two months, mm -hmm. and if it's not rigged already, I hope that we can get rid of Daniel Andrews, who yeah. did this. Is that the way the winds are blowing right now? You just never know with politics, do you? Yeah. It's really hard to say, but I know that there are some parties that are really trying hard, and, and we're going to be campaigning as well, and we'll, and we'll, and we'll do our best. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it was... I can't even really explain in words, like, how, how terrible it was, you know, to be yeah. shot at by your own people. Who, who you, you, you pay their wages, like we pay the police to protect us and now they're shooting at us. I mean, they even goaded us, like, come on guys, let's go, in a, in a protest. Police in uniform, come on guys, let's go. And they've got all the weapons and we've got nothing. And they're like, come on, it's like, <laughs> what? Well, what do you think owes to that? Like, <laughs> were they just following the media narrative or like, were they confused or maybe they're just like also kind of like they're, they're, they have their own kind of too much energy from the lockdowns and they have nothing better to do? Like, what do you think? <laughs> there's a that? few there's a few scenarios. A lot of police did refuse to go mm. to these events. Mm -hmm. I will say that mm. actually the Victoria police are having a hard time keeping employees at the moment. Right, and they, right now. Yes. Yeah. And they're doing a drive for new ones. So what they would have to do, they had to bring police from the suburbs. Mm -hmm. OK. And um, they would also use rookies that, you know, have something to prove. I see. But also, like, a, like um, you know, the changing rooms at a football game, how they're like, come on, guys, we can do this. Let's go get them. Mm. They would do that to the police before they went out to the protest. They, it's these people that are keeping us locked down. They want to kill your grandma. Mm. Like they want, they're, they're stopping your kids from going to school, school because they keep protesting and they keep extending the lockdown. Yeah. So they kind of came out with this, you know, and you had different types of police. You had the police who were just doing it because they wanted to keep their job. And then you had the, the police that really enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know what? We, we've got a lot of court cases happening against them, especially with the, with the rubber bullets. Mm -hmm. This one guy was like, was like literally like this and they just shot him three times. Oh. You know, and, and if, it was any, if it was a few centimetres to one side, he would have had internal bleeding. He had internal bleeding and things like that. So they're going to be accountable eventually. Yeah, but thus far, nobody's been really held accountable. There has been one or two situations uh, where the police have been fired yeah. um, for like literally king, I don't know what's, what it's called when you take someone and you just like slam them on the ground. Um, oh. But th just there slamming was, them, I guess, right? No, there was no provocation. The guy was just standing there and the police just went up to him and just wow. dropped him on the concrete floor. Um, and, you know, so yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of those cases. And, um, you know, even my charges being dropped, you can't, you can't take a law-abiding citizen, put them in prison for 22 days because you feel like it, and then drop the charges and say it's no longer in the public's interest. That was their excuse. Mm. It's no longer in the public's interest. Well, was it ever in the public's interest to charge me? Yeah. You can't just do that and get away with it. So there's a lot of people pushing back mm. to make them accountable, and I'm sure they will be. What, was your, what were your 22 days in prison like? Um, actually really relaxing. <laughs> <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but... I'm sure you, you travel and work really hard and I work really hard too. And so I tried to use that time as a, as a relaxation, but look, I'm not a robot. Obviously it's traumatic mm. to be strip searched um, mm. when you're a law abiding citizen and nothing like that's ever happened. And to, and I was in isolation the whole time as well. So no sunshine, no outdoors, no breeze, no nothing. Mm. 
uh, because they didn't want to take a PCR test. Mm. And, you know, they speak to you like a dog. They call you a number. Mm. You know, I was uh, cell 22, mm. not Monica, but cell 22. And they talked to you through a little slip in the door. And, um, you know, there was some slivers of niceness from the staff, obviously. And um, I was really positive in there because um, I knew I was doing the right thing. Mm. And um, I, I knew that the police who arrested me probably weren't sleeping as well as me. Mm. And I knew that there's no way I could have signed those bail conditions. So I was, I was in complete peace with what I had done. And um, on that note, I will take this opportunity to say that, you know, sometimes the worst things that happen to us end up being the best. Well, because they literally put me in prison to try and stop me or silence me, it did the exact opposite tenfold mm. because now I have a story and I might not be speaking to you right now. Mm. So it's kind of funny and I, and I, and I did like, I did laugh about it a lot in prison, just like, <laughs> mm. you didn't see that coming, did you, you know? Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, so, so it's been actually a blessing in disguise um, and I've been able to network because of what they did to me. So I kind of thank them and I forgive them already for it because it worked out well, but I don't really want to go back. <laughs> Is were, you, were you as optimist, optimistic? Because I can imagine when you're sitting there, you didn't know that it was going to be 22 days, right? You were facing the potential for years. Um, no, the, the longest was probably going to be three months. Um, so I was okay with three months. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I could have handled that. But also, um, I, I, I never, I, I kind of thought it would, would not be too long. Mm. But, but I was okay if it was longer. It's not a Julian Assange situation, you know, oh, yeah. like poor Julian Assange. I stand for him. But, oh. um, you know, so, um, so yeah, three months I was okay with. But, um, but look, I mean, it was, it was pretty grueling, but yeah. it was all right. <laughs> what type of fines are you facing right now? Oh, gosh, I don't, I don't even know. Like, not wearing a not wearing a cloth on my face, you know, being outside my five kilometers. Ta talking to people um, in the Netherlands. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> I, well, I, I hope I can get back home, you know. <laughs> but um, I'm still on bail, um, but it doesn't say you can't travel overseas. So mm. maybe I've got some uh, some interesting things get, uh, waiting for me at home, but we'll see. <laughs> I guess last question, if the people watching this video are from other countries, America, a lot of people will be watching in America, and let's say they they face the same thing, but let's say in the future they face it again and, and they're they're going to be in the situation where they're like, oh, I have kids, I have I have this you know career, I have, I have these things to lose, I want to stand up, but let's say there are, there are things holding me back. What, what would you tell them? I would say that we all have this voice in our heads or in our souls. I would say it's God, but you can say it's whatever you want it to be. We have this voice that says, you can do it, or you can do more, or you can do this, or you can do that. And it's listening to that voice that is the only thing that I've done differently to anyone else. You know, I, I'm not spe more special than anyone else. I'm not more courageous than anyone else. I just listened to the voice and I believed that it was telling me the right thing. That's it. So even if it's something small, like you should spend more time with your kids today, or you should not eat that piece of cake, whatever it is, it's those voices and that's your conscience or God or whatever. And if you're in a situation where you are faced with a decision where you think this could lead to a lot of pain, mm -hmm. but I'm doing the right thing, this might lead to less pain, but I'm, my conscience is going to suffer. You all, the, the right thing is always the right thing to do, mm. even if there's pain. The, 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 the feeling of peace that you get when you've done the right thing, even if you're in pain, is just far superior than the feeling you get of the comfort that you, that you, um, you know, uh, didn't follow your conviction for. Mm. So my suggestion would be trust in God or, or trust in fate, whatever you want to call it. Do the right thing because you'll be proud of yourself. Your children will be proud of you. Your wife, your husband will be proud of you. And even if there's pain, you can look in the mirror and say that you did the best. And good things always come to people who do the right thing. It just sometimes takes some time. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too.